you know, when I started the company, I figured there had to be a better way of training folks. And I worked for great organizations. And the best idea we had was to fly everybody to Dallas, put them in a dark conference room, have a product manager, you know, show them PowerPoint slides. And probably the best thing is just supporting all kinds of customers completely change how they educate their employees, their channels, their customers, and so on. Welcome to Business Ninjas, brought to you by Write For Me where you'll hear from business leaders who are out there growing their business and slaying it every day. Learn from the masters. Let's get started. Thanks for joining us today on Business Ninjas. We appreciate you stopping by. Thanks for coming aboard. Yeah, truly my pleasure. Thanks. All right. Why don't we start by knocking out some of the basics? So, uh, you know, if you could both say your your names and your roles in the company, and then let's also knock through the name of, or I'm sorry, the website, uh, actually, and where you're based. Jacqueline, you go first there. Sure. So uh, my name is Jacqueline. I'm the marketing lead here at Knowledge Anywhere. And my role is to really ensure that uh, our products are seen and heard by the people who need to see and hear them. Um, we have multiple channels of distribution. For example, we have paid media. We also have uh, four blogs that come out a month, videos. Uh, we have webinars, we have quarterly eBooks and monthly email campaigns. So there's a ton of ways to get involved, to learn more about our products, which are a learning management system. We have a course library with over five, uh, with over 50,000, I'm sorry, uh, wow. 50,000 pre-made professional courses. We have course content development. So that is customized uh, and branded to the specific user. We also have a learning distribution platform called Conveyor and a SCORM conversion tool called SCORMify. So uh, we really pride ourselves on the training ecosystem, and my goal is to make sure that people know about it. That's a lot. Awesome. And Jamie, after that, I'm not sure what I'm going to add. I mean, that was, that, was great. <laughs> that, that was great. So, yeah, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm Charlie Gillette, and um, I'm president of Knowledge Anywhere. It was founded uh, 25 years ago. Um, I sold the company two years ago now, it's hard to believe it's been two years ago, to uh, IEH, which is a global uh, leader in food safety and consulting. Um, we're headquartered in Seattle. Um, however, we have folks you know, all over the country, and also we have a, a software development house in Bosnia, and um, one of our chief uh, developers are, is in Kauai, but, so, but uh, our, our hub is here, and our website is knowledgeanywhere.com. Great. All right. And uh, wow, 25 year legacy. That's fantastic. Uh, and maybe you can give us each a little just a brief background on what your career arc has been to kind of bring you to the, the present opportunity. You can go first, Jacqueline. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I started at UW, uh, University of Washington. I am a local Seattle girl by trade, nice. born and raised. And I got my bachelor's in communications and a second one in political science. From there, I moved to Europe for a few years, about three to four years, and I got my master's there in marketing at the world's oldest business school called ESCP. Oh, wow. And um, I entered into Knowledge Anywhere with about six years of experience in B2B marketing. And honestly, this, this company has really grown my, my skills, it's grown my knowledge and my confidence in the marketing area. It's great. And as you can tell, Jacqueline just does a great job, you know, representing, you know, the company, extending our brand, you know, all the way, all the way through. So, um, yeah, so actually my, my, I graduated from San Diego state. So I'm actually uh, an Aztec by, uh, by original. So I came from San Diego up to the great Northwest and I met my uh, wonderful wife and she's from the Northwest. And so my, my degree is actually in finance and accounting. And I found out very early in my career that I love studying finance and accounting, but I really didn't like doing finance and accounting. And so I shifted over, I shifted over to sales and that's truly where my love and passion has been is on the sales side. And then I was with um, Baxter Healthcare for a decade. 
Mm. And then I was with Macaw Cellular, and uh, Macaw was bought by a- AT&T Wireless. I helped start uh, their wireless data division that uh, you know wow. was now turned into a huge, huge industry. And thanks to the support of my my wife, um, she, she you know said, Let, "Let's." Uh, I've always wanted to start a company. Probably not a great time to start a company when uh, you know my son was one years old. So the idea of leaving <laughs> leaving a big company to go to a non existent startup uh, was uh, yeah I, I would not recommend that. But it all turned out fine, um, yeah. you know, out, out there. And um, with that, it started off very much like what we do today. Still, is you know when I started the company, I figured there had to be a better way of training folks. And I worked for great organizations. And the best idea we had was to fly everybody to Dallas, put them in a dark conference room, have a product manager, you know, show them PowerPoint slides, and then fly them home and think they were going to learn something. It it never works. I figured there had to be a better way of training people. And you can imagine, uh, Jamie, that the industry has evolved tremendously in 25 years. The term e-learning didn't exist 25 years ago. So it's been a a great journey. We have a great team. And probably the best thing is just supporting all kinds of customers completely change how they educate their employees, their channels, their customers, and so on. And the pandemic, the pandemic didn't magnify it. It just highlighted it. Anybody that did not have a virtual education platform, they were in, they were in trouble. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. It was, (laughs) it was a, a big learning experience for everybody at that point. So I think you, you've touched a bit on sort of the elevator pitch and the positioning for the company. Um, and, I, and I think you gave a little bit of focus on which industries and verticals you, you know, you, you've had greater success in than others, but maybe let's just step back <clears throat> through that for a second and, you know, walk us through where you started. What was the initial sort of focus in the company and which industries maybe did you start with? And then how did that grow? Yeah, so probably from a focus perspective is um, we focus on corporations, you know, for the most part, it's all corporations. So with that, we don't really do government. We don't do K through 12. We don't do higher education. Um, so it's it's the corporate world. Mm-hmm. Um, and we started out with, you know, folks needing to train their channel. So very quickly is like we need we need to train our channel how to position, you know, this technology how to position our services and so on. And then very quickly it was it bled back into, well, we need to train our our employees also. And so for almost all our customers, Jamie, it's we we either start with training their external audience and it bleeds back to their internal audience, mm-hmm. or we start training, you know, providing systems in place to train their employees. And somebody goes, you know what? Our channel could use this exact same training. But uh, almost everything we do touches multiple audiences with the platform because the content can be used multiple ways. You know, like Jacqueline said, we have this huge library, but if somebody's going to develop content that's specific to their company, most likely other folks, you know, in, in their system needs that. So it again, and then um, a big chunk of what we do is in the medical device industry. So okay. we do a huge chunk in the medical device industry, our parent company, um, you know, being IEH in the food safety industry. So we do work in the food safety industry. But then we have customers like, you know, va- very valuable customers like Ford and Synchrony and Costco and so on. And, and sometimes folks come to us and say, we're really special. Well, you know, most people have the exact same challenge. They're very, right. unless, unless, unless if, if NASA came to us and said, we need to train people on the International Space Station, we might go, okay, now you are special. <laughs> but other yeah. than that, most organizations have the same challenges uh, with educating their employees and, and making it engaging and so on. So that's interesting that you can get to both the and employees and then the external channels that, that, I mean, speaks volumes about how valued you are inside of the company, but that must lead to a very sticky relationship, right? These folks are not going to want to um, switch horses, I would think, you know, if you're doing that good of a job that you're getting that far embedded into the company, that's a great sign yeah. that things are going well. Look, I think our average, when we're picking up new customers all the time, thanks to our sales and marketing team, but our average tenure with our customers is like uh, nine years. You know, so, awesome. so we've been doing business with some of our customers for 23 years um, out there. So it's it's two things. One, it's how we treat them. It is very sticky. 
because yeah. you become embedded in the organization. Um, but then, you know, we, be, we become part of their organization. So it's just not a, you know, vendor customer relationship. We, we become just an extension of their organization. And as you probably, if you did a little research on it, the space is very crowded. I mean, right. so, you know, and that might be your next question, but I won't, I won't go into that. So. Well, yeah, I was wondering how you, how you sort of position yourselves. I mean, it sounds like once you get into a company with that sort of average customer engagement time, obviously you're distinguishing yourselves once you get in the door, but in a crowded space, how are you separating shells out from the competition for people that are just encountering the company for the first time? Yeah. And because the way you just summarized it is accurate. Once we get in the door, we're going to be there forever, you know, because just the, the fabric of the company, the technology, we're going to take care of them and so on. It's getting in the door. You know, you know, Jacqueline's job is to find the right doors to go knock on. So the key thing for us is somebody that's looking the right person. So somebody that is the right person in the company, the right company. And then the right timing. So are they looking for a better way to train their channels or customers, employees, and so on? And then from the differentiator is there's lots of folks that have a learning management system or a learning experience platform. And there's been a tremendous amount of money that's been, you know, flown that came into this industry. You know, all the VCs, you know, just love this space. So there's been a ton of money that's come into it. They're all true SaaS-based companies because that's what uh, that's what the investors wanted to see. Well, what makes us sticky is we have a great SaaS-based product, but on top of it, we do professional services. You know, so we do professional services of help, helping them curate content, helping them develop content, helping them you know, launch the programs. If you are truly a VC-based company, they don't want to see any professional services. Right. Yo, know, on that, they want to see all SaaS-based revenue. So, in in our our parent company, they that they saw that that's what we did, and so when somebody comes to us, you know, we will we have a we have a trial system. We'll set up the trial system. We'll load their content onto it. So we we will treat them you know very special and want to make sure they're succeeding. But everybody will say the same thing when you go talk to them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, we're very special. We're, you know, we have great customer service. We'll give you the white glove element. You know, when they start interacting with us, then they see that we actually do it. And then if they are coming from one of our competitors, because some of the large players in the industry that are either publicly traded or VC backed, it's expensive to take care of your customers. And so they've had less than stellar experiences of people calling them back upgrading systems, helping them, you know, and so on. So it's um, there, it's a double-edged sword is everybody's interested in it, but sometimes it creates an environment where, you know, it's easy for us to compete against if they're coming from, you know, I won't say any company, but company X, because right. we know that we know that how they've been treated because it's expensive to treat people with white glove, you know, customer service. Yeah. And I would think if you've got the duration of, um, uh, you know, relationship with a company that you have, not having a professional services arm. I don't know how you do that over the course of a decade with the way that a, a tech stack inside of a company is going to change. Like, how do you, uh, you, you can't be expected to just do that all like, oh, APIs are going to cover it all. This will be just fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we, you, you you need to have publicly available APIs and connectors and things like that. But, you know, you're going to run into a company that says, well, thank you, but our IT group they need help. They need help with right. Microsoft. They need help with Active Directory. We've not done it before. We have Active Directory, and it's not hard. We just need to have smart people that will help them on it. So, right, that's great. Well, and you touched on um, the COVID era. So, I'm wondering. You obviously had a playbook and and an idea for how to implement this with companies, but I wonder if the nature of your engagements changed with this influx of companies that had zero clue about how to do this and they were obviously in a sprint to get something going quickly so what was that experience like yeah i mean a couple things one is you know covid was just devastating on in industries like the travel industry like hospitality you know like so there's like segments that didn't even exist during covid you know so mm -hmm. you, you know you, you know out there and then there was um but then folks we actually had some 
folks that we were talking to that they thought it was going to be short lived and, and they were doing everything in person. And they said, well, we're just going to ride it out for a little bit and this will be short lived. And and it was and they they went out of business because, you know, they didn't have a way of doing it. Most leading organizations like like I mentioned, Siemens and Ford, they were already on this curve and they've been on this curve for, you know, for a long time to have a virtual way of training folks. It just got magnified. I mean, because you could imagine nobody was going into a hospital to train somebody on how to use an imaging instrument. I mean, and nobody was right. leaving the hospital environment to fly, you know, to New Jersey to learn how to do it. So it, you know, it just magnified that we need to find a they already had the system in place, but before there was a little bit of an option that, well, we can do it in person or we can do it online. And they might go, oh, let's do it in person this time. Well, that that all disappeared, you know, out there. And it's it's not gonna go back. It's not gonna go back. You know, right. it's not it's it's never gonna go back. You know, I should never say never, but uh, you know, it's it's never gonna go back to the way it was because now that um you know, folks see um, how two things. One, it probably wasn't all that effective before. So, you know, so the method of flying people across the country, which is expensive, they're away from their family. Um, it doesn't scale. Um, you, you can't, you, there's not a consistency to it. So it's not like the old model was extremely effective. It was just what right. what people did. And so now the the new model, and we see it as a blended approach. You know, we see it that folks say, "Okay, we'd like to do um, some of our people in person. So can you you know help us train people in person?" However, we have multiple plants, so we're going to need to do um, Zoom training, do virtual education. But then we need to have a reinforcement, and we'll have e-learning for that. So most going forward, it's going to be a blended approach um, for sure of having e-learning for reinforcement, um, micro learning for just just in time learning, uh, webinars, and then a little piece of, um, it, you know, a little piece in person. The things that need to be in person still would be, you know, team building, you know, you, know, you still have a hard time building relationships over Zoom, right. you know, so, you know, you know, or theoretical brainstorming, you know, the idea that we're developing a new product and we need to get everybody together on that um, and do some brainstorming or when it, it's physical in nature, you know, when it's, you know, a wind turbine, you know, even with augmented right. reality and stuff, it's hard to train a service person on a wind turbine virtually. Right. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Uh, yeah. So. Okay. And is there a, uh, you know, an ideal customer? type for you is that is it less about the size of the company and more about kind of what stage they're at when you're looking to engage with a company what's sort of your ideal customer profile yeah our, our deal uh customer profile would be like a thousand um for our new customers would be a thousand mm -hmm. employees you know a thousand employees is a good cutoff because they're they're having issues with you know, scalability, um, lots of industry, there's knowledge retiring, both within, let's say, the healthcare, um, automotive, there's really critical knowledge that's just, just retiring. Um, and then also a thousand to sell to a thousand, uh, Jamie, they're not going to have a huge learning and development committee. You know, they're going to have, you know, they're going to have a training manager, director of operations, and an HR person. And so just the complexity is selling it. I mean, our big customers we, we've been into, it, I'm not sure we could get into them today, you know, because we really don't want to bump into a huge, you know, learning and development organization. The other one is somebody that's looking to leave a competitor, you know, A, B, or C. Mm -hmm. And because they're they're already, they know the value of a learning management system. They got the infrastructure in place. They have content. Um you know, we are very competitive from an investment perspective and very feature rich. And so that's a good group for us to sell into is a big company that's looking to, a big company that's looking, looking to move out there. Um, yep. Yeah. But the idea of like, OK, we're going to go call on we're going to go call on PepsiCo cold. The idea of being able to find the person and, you know, in PepsiCo 
which is the right person, the right time, the right decision. It's really hard. I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. Just be going through layers and layers and layers of management to get to the right. And it's there, yeah. you know, it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's probably there. It's just trying to find them. Right. And Jacqueline, you already touched on a little bit about the outreach uh, strategy for the company. The, obviously, it sounds like there's a ton going on there. But maybe just to recap that, what is the the strategy for letting folks know that that you exist? You know, there's if the profile is a thousand employees and up or, or around about that. Obviously, there's lots of those types of companies out there. So what are you doing to get the word out? And what social media channels are you active on where people can learn more? Sure. So we have we spread our net very wide. We cast a wide net. So we use some partners in the industry. So right now we're listed on I think thirty five platforms. Wow. Uh, and profiles, for example, Gartner, G two, Captera, um, as a way to just get our name out there. If you look up Knowledge Anywhere, Knowledge Anywhere LMS, you'll see that. You know, our SEO takes the first three pages as all of our own content. And part of that is just being present on multiple sites. Yeah. Um, we also have, as I mentioned before, our organic marketing channels, which is really just content creation. And our goal there is to try to um, meet people where they are. So some of the, the content is very simple. What is an LMS? Why do you need an LMS? What are the signs that an LMS needs to be implemented. Um, others are a bit more technical, or if you're mid-level, if you already have an LMS. So for example, um, ways to migrate an LMS to a new system. Uh, what is a one-year check-in checklist that you can go through to see that you're constantly optimizing and making sure that your training doesn't stagnate? Um, another one might be in a different stage of the buying process, for example, um, what you can do to get your manager's approval on an LMS, how you can sell your LMS and re-engage your employees into the system, how you can compensate employees for training and get their buy-in. Um, because you could have a beautiful platform, but if nobody's using it, it's not mm -hmm. much good. Right. So organic content is big. I did also mention that we do have paid channels such as uh, Google ads, although that is a very small part of our lead generation process. Um, those are our main, main pieces. I'm sure there's a lot more that I forgot to mention off the top of my head, um, but those are the big ones. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then are you, uh, it sounds like with all the video content, I'm guessing you have a pretty thriving video component on YouTube and, and other places. Is that, can folks find you there? Uh, absolutely. So the best place is our website, as uh, Charlie said, knowledgeanywhere.com. But we do have a presence on YouTube. We have a presence on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And we post there about twice a week. That's great. All right. Well, thanks for stopping by today. We learned a ton. Um, and obviously, you've been killing it for a long time. And I'm sure 2023 is going to be no different. So it's going to be fun to see where the company goes for the rest of the year. Um, so thanks again for stopping by. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jamie.